This show is a part of the podcast network of the Walled Garden Philosophical Society, an international community of philosophers and seekers dedicated to the pursuit of truth, wisdom, virtue, and the divine, wherever they may be found. To find out more, go to thewalledgarden.com. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Soul Searching with Seneca. Now today we're finally moving on to number 10, epistle number 10, on living to oneself. And uh, this is a brief yet a, a really valuable letter. You know, there's so much wisdom packed within it. And so hopefully we'll make it all the way through it today, but we might have to stop halfway through to leave some space and uh, some, some air to breathe uh, on a few of these ideas. But nonetheless, we will uh, start reading and see where we find ourselves. So he says, quote, Yes, I do not change my opinion. Avoid the many, avoid the few, avoid even the individual. I know of no one with whom I should be willing to have you shared. And see what an opinion of you I have, for I dare to trust you with your own self. Crates, they say, the disciple of the very stillbo who I mentioned in a former letter, noticed a young man walking by himself and asked him what he was doing all alone. I am communing with myself, replied the youth. Pray be careful then, said Crates, and take good heed. You are communing with a bad man. When persons are in mourning or fearful about something, we are accustomed to watch them that we may prevent them from making a wrong use of their loneliness. No thoughtless person ought to be left alone. In such cases, he only plans folly and heaps up future dangers for himself and for others. He brings into play his base desires. The mind displays what fear or shame used to repress. It wets his boldness, stirs his passions, and goads his anger. And finally, the only benefit that solitude confers, the habit of trusting no man and of fearing no witnesses, is lost to the fool for he betrays himself. Mark therefore what my hopes are for you, nay, rather what I am promising myself, inasmuch as hope is merely the title of an uncertain blessing. I do not know any person with whom I should prefer you to associate rather than yourself. I remember in what a great-souled way you hurled forth certain phrases, and how full of strength they were, I immediately congratulated myself and said, These words did not come from the edge of the lips. These utterances have a solid foundation. This man is not one of the many. He has real regard for his welfare. Speak and live in this way. See to it that nothing keeps you down. End quote. So I'm going to pause here and break down what I take away from the past few sentences and paragraphs, but one of the main reasons uh, why I'm kind of excited about breaking down this letter is because when I started reading it, I was really reminded of how I, I just don't know if Seneca is actually writing to a person called Lucilius here. Because uh, as you may know uh, from previous episodes, the only you know way that we know of Lucilius in terms of historical references is through Seneca's letters. So we're not really sure if he's a person. Uh, we do know that Lucilius is the diminutive form of Lucius, which is Seneca's first name or Lucius, uh, which means light. So they both mean the same thing. It's essentially the same as if I was writing a letter to somebody called Simeon, which is just a different version of the same name, Simon. Uh, you know, so it's it's kind of a, a strange coincidence. And, and then there's multiple points in his writings where it just seems like he's not actually speaking to another person, but that he's actually speaking almost to his soul. You might think of it like that. We already know that Seneca talks about, you know, the supremacy of the soul. It's the number one thing. It's the thing that it's that spark of divinity that we have within us that allows us to gain a, a deeper insight into the wisdom of the cosmos. And and it kind of seems as though Seneca is using a literary technique or almost a poetic technique here to to dive deep into his soul and to discover the parts of himself that, that would be awakened if he were to write in this kind of way. And so I think it's interesting to think about it like that. And there's a few reasons, as I said, that I wanted to... Uh, 
break down from these past few sentences and, and, and paragraphs. So firstly, he kind of comes in with a, a pretty harsh uh, admonition, you might say. And what he says is, you know, avoid the many, avoid the few, even the individual. I know of no one with whom I would be willing to have you shared. Now, you know, you could think that, okay, if he's talking to his friend Lucilius, uh, that seems like a psychopathic relationship, right? Where he's, he's getting way too overprotective, right? Trying to, to keep Lucilius to himself. But if you think about it as he's talking to his soul, right? He's talking to the part of himself that is most precious. You know, what do you keep away from other people? What do you keep away from the influence of the mob or even from the person who might have ill wishes towards that beautiful thing? You know, you keep very precious things away from those people. You keep them hidden. Uh, and, and so it actually reminds me of this passage in the Bible, don't throw pearls before swine. You know, it seems like that's kind of what Seneca is getting at here, is, is he wants to keep his soul within his grasp, within his influence, right, where he is he's really making some progress and he's seeing that it's a beautiful thing that is shining forth, uh, but he, he really needs to, to keep the influence of other people away from this work of art that he is he's producing, that is his soul, his, his spark of divinity. And it's funny because he takes it even further and he says, maybe to his soul, if I'm correct, he says, and see what an opinion of you I have, for I dare to trust you with your own self. And he tells this hilarious story of, of Crates, I'm, I'm guessing Crates of Thebes, the, the famous uh, cynic philosopher who has so many funny stories like this, but he sees this guy walking along and he asks him what he's doing. And the guy says, I'm communing with myself. And uh, Crates, in his usual cynical, uh, hilarious way, says, you know, be careful because you're communing with a bad man, right? And so Seneca makes this point that you know, can, can you even really trust your soul to yourself, right? Because uh, at, at our core, we all have so many faults and we are constantly walking down wayward paths just by our nature, and it's, I think it's a very interesting point that he makes, and he continues by suggesting that in the same way that we would, you know, watch carefully somebody who's going through mourning or grief because we don't quite trust them with themselves, you know, that there's a certain danger there that they're going to fall down into dark places and they're going to do something dangerous or, or harmful to themselves. We watch them, and in the same way, it seems like he's also watching his soul in that way, recognizing that no matter how much progress he makes, he's still fragile enough that if left to his own devices, he might fall back into those bad habits, into those, those dark paths that he's walked before. And it's, it's, it's really, it's such an interesting way of talking about this, right? It's such an interesting kind of poetic, uh, secretive way that he's talking with his soul here. And, and I find this just incredibly meaningful to be reading something like this because it's it's personal. You know, when you get this this uh, depth about your understanding of how he was writing and to whom he was writing, you get to see another side of Seneca, the side of Seneca where he's constantly wrestling with himself, trying to figure out how he can polish his own soul. And he goes on to make an interesting point. I, I won't reread it, but the, the point that he's trying to make in the, in the following sentences is really talking about how if a person who hasn't really got a grip on their soul, who hasn't polished it to the degree that they might like to, or who hasn't got a strengthened character and a strengthened kind of fortitude about their way of being, right, if they are left to their own devices just with themselves... Uh, you know, it's very easy for them to to fall back under the grip of their passions, to fall back under the grip of their vices, right? And so they very quickly, uh, you know, devise plans to to engage in folly or, you know, to engage in vice and the things that are really bad for their soul. 
and and so you know he, he makes a very reasonable and very truthful statement about what we are like as human beings because that's exactly what we are like you know it, it's 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 really you've got to humble yourself to recognize that that's just who we are you know if if you really haven't developed your character to a sufficient extent when you're left to your own devices you'll probably do all kinds of things that are just terrible for you right all, all kinds of things that you would never do in front of other people but you know you do them because nobody's watching and 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 you know that's that's not a good place that you want to be in terms of your character and so really what seneca means by bringing this point up is it, it, it's brilliant in a way i love that he says this it, he's basically trying to say i don't even know if i trust my own soul with itself <laughs> you know he's trying he's trying to say i wouldn't trust you to the many i wouldn't trust you to the few i wouldn't trust you to the individual i don't even know if i'd trust you to myself but he's saying i feel like i'm at that point and and, and he's saying to his soul i hope you can see here that I am trusting you, right? Because I have a high opinion of you. I, I believe that you're ready to be able to pick up the load of, of you know, me trusting you uh, to develop yourself now. And the proof of this kind of concept that I'm trying to develop here in terms of understanding what Seneca is trying to say comes in the next sentence, right? Where he says, Mark therefore what my hopes are for you, nay, rather what I am promising myself, inasmuch as hope is merely a title of an uncertain blessing. I do not know any person with whom I should prefer you to associate rather than yourself. He says, I remember in what a great souled way you hurled forth certain phrases and how full of strength they were. And this is a particularly important part to focus on. He says, I immediately congratulated myself and said, these words did not come from the edge of the lips. These utterances have a solid foundation. This man is not one of the many. He has regard for his real welfare. And then he goes, speak and live in this way. See to it that nothing keeps you down. So I think this is just a really beautiful way of Seneca saying that uh, he has recognized the times when his soul was present and, and was engaged with life and was speaking uh, truthfully and, and with a firm foundation, right? That's what he says there. And he wants his soul to show up like that in all of his life, to have that kind of strength and that kind of fortitude and to not be diminished by the influences of other people. And look, I will very gladly admit, if, if this all d turns out to be a very silly interpretation of Seneca's writings, then I'll gladly admit that I'm wrong. There's still some value, hopefully, in what I'm saying and how I'm interpreting this. But, but, but nonetheless, uh, I think that it's interesting to think about it in this way, particularly seeing as he says, you know, I, I immediately congratulated myself and said these words did not come from, you know, the edge of the lips. You know, he's, he's saying that I recognized within myself that something was happening and I was happy for it to be happening, right? These words did not just come from the edge of the lips. These utterances have a firm foundation is how he puts it, right? So it's almost like that point in your life where you're realizing that you're kind of, you know, you're not just speaking words for the sake of speaking words or speaking things just because you've heard them. No, you're you're speaking from the heart and from the mind, right, with a strength about your words and a conviction about your words that you understand who you are and you understand what you're here to do, almost. It seems like that kind of moment, right? And it's funny, you know, I, I even think about this in the context of me recording these episodes. There are some times when I sit down here to record these episodes on Seneca's writings and I catch myself just speaking for the sake of speaking, you know, saying something just because it sounds like it fits in where it's supposed to be and saying something because I've heard this idea before and so here I'll say this, you know, and, and hopefully you guys don't recognize that I do that too often and I don't think that I do that too often, but... But, you know, there are some times where I'll start talking about an idea or I'll start talking about a passage from Seneca that really interests me and inspires me and, and which I believe I actually know enough to talk about, right? And I'll go on a train of thought that just takes me away and, and maybe a few minutes will go by and I will stop speaking and I'll realize that, man, that was so much fun when I was 
really speaking with conviction about something that I was passionate about that had a foundation of truth below it that was kind of hoisting it up, right? And it's it's a different feeling and, and you want that feeling in your life as much as possible, that feeling of having that firm foundation beneath you to stand upon and to uh, to, to guide you in your life. And, and that's something that comes from a well-developed and a well-discovered soul, uh, as we are discovering in, in, in this letter. And one thing that we do know about Seneca is that he was a, you know, very well-trained orator. You know, he was somebody who, uh, his, his life work in many ways was dependent on his ability to capture people, you know, to, to inspire the people who he spoke to and to uh, connect with them on a deeper level. Right? Because otherwise he, you know, he wasn't a very good orator and he probably wouldn't have got much done. And so he knows those moments when he's speaking from the depths of his soul and he knows when he's speaking from a weak foundation. And so I just think that looking at this letter from this lens, you know, from the lens of Seneca talking about himself and about finally being able to uh, hope that his soul can kind of walk on its own and can spring forth uh, with all of its benefits on its own, uh, that is kind of a, a, a it, it's, it's a cool picture of Seneca and his writings that can really help us to see where he was coming from. And I think that this is going to set a really uh, strong foundation, seeing as we're talking about that sort of stuff, a strong foundation for the rest of our study of Seneca, uh, thinking about it sort of through this lens and recognizing that as he says here, he wants to speak and live in this way, speaking and living from a firm, firm foundation, speaking and living with conviction, with gusto, you might say. And and that's a beautiful picture. I love that. And, you know, I'd, I'm, I'm going to stop here. And I think that we're going to spend a little bit more time on this letter in the next episode, because you could almost see this letter as a prayer to his soul, you know, kind of encouraging it to come forth and to help him to live in a better way and to be upon that firm foundation. And he goes on in this letter to say briefly a few words about, about prayer and what that means to him and how we should engage with prayer in our lives. And I think that's going to be a very interesting conversation to have, but one which I probably don't have enough time to do in in this episode. So uh, until next time, I hope that you've really enjoyed this episode and I hope I didn't overstep any uh, unnecessary boundaries. Uh, but uh, but I hope that you've taken a few things away from it and, and, and I've certainly found this extremely interesting diving into this letter. So with that said, I'll talk to you next time.